You know, there are few creatures out there as recognizable as a turtle. No matter where you go around the world, everybody knows what a turtle looks like. You know it when you see it. The shell gives it away. Today we're going to talk about turtles. It's ironic that I now study turtles and that you're taking a vertebrate zoology class from somebody that studies turtles. Because I did the same thing when I was in University of Toronto. I had a vertebrate zoology class that was taught by Nicholas Morozowski. And Dr. Morozowski was very much a well-known figure in the sea turtle conservation realm. He was one of the sort of the pioneers. I mean, that was born in 1934. He was one of the pioneers of conserving sea turtles, coming up with captive breeding programs for hatchlings, and generally trying to preserve the beaches that they're living on and then try to breed on. So during the course of this vertebrate zoology class, I was quite enthralled because he'd always tell us all sorts of tales of travel to far off places, kind of like I do now. And you know, I remember having a question, and I don't remember what the question was, but I remember looking to find him in his office. And he wasn't the easiest person to approach. He's quite an awkward fellow. And I remember going to him one day with a question, and I don't remember what the question was. I'm sure it was something very boring, and asking him um, to help me out. So I knocked on the door of his office. He said, come in. And I looked at him, and before I could say anything, he's... I noticed this book that was sitting on his on his desk and he noticed me noticing the book and he said tell me what do you think of this book what do you think of this cover and I didn't know what to say I was kind of taken aback by this question he didn't even say hi to me that was the first thing he said to me and I was like well it's it's nice I guess you know it's uh, it would be nice if I had a turtle on there or something and he just seemed absolutely upset because I guess he was writing this book, Conserving Sea Turtles, which went on to become some kind of classic of sea turtle conservation. Go figure. And he was uh, he was basically kind of uh, upset because I guess soon after he found out that this was going to be the cover that the publishing company was going to go with. But it wasn't the cover that he proposed. He showed me this other copy of the cover, which looked like this. And you can see here in the picture... It's a, uh, a, a young woman kissing a baby sea turtle, but at the same time off the coast of the Horn of Africa, somewhere in like Somalia or somewhere where he did do some work on sea turtle conservation and in Kenya, uh, is a picture of uh, a, young, a young boy uh, hacking the limb off of a leatherback sea turtle, which presumably he'll do for food. So the cover is very visually stimulating because it illustrates kind of the dilemma with uh, conservation in general, not just sea turtles where you're trying to balance the needs of local people, such as you know starving African children on the coast of, of uh, Somalia or places like that, with uh, the need to conserve, which is generally the kind of thing that falls into the realm of once you're well off, right? Or once you're, you, know, you, you start to see the point of it kind of uh, earlier on. So, I remember thinking, wow, this is a weird thing to be talking about. And I don't remember what the conversation went, but I remember looking at this cover. And then later on, I tried to find this cover. I guess it got reprinted uh, with this cover in mind. Uh, but at the time, he was quite a, quite upset that that was the cover. Uh, I guess that they figured their target audience wouldn't want to be reminded of this dichotomy in conservation. But conservation is important, and conservation of turtles is important. The turtles are a fairly diverse group, even though they all kind of look the same. There's 14 families, about 356 species. Even though we all see turtles everywhere, and uh, they're very common, go to any pond, you have a very good chance, especially in Florida, of seeing a turtle. But the reality is that the majority of turtle species around the world are in fairly precipitous decline. And it's unfortunate, because the perception is that they're doing well, and it's really because of only a few invasive species that have managed to become overly abundant. Uh, but most native turtles within their native ranges uh, are decreasing in number. And they're actually probably the most imperiled vertebrate group. Maybe they're tied with the amphibians for this. So what is a turtle? Well, turtle is basically its shell, right? Uh, that shell is usually made of bone with a keratin covering 
or it could be cartilage with a keratin covering in the case of a softshell turtle. So here's some examples of a turtle design that has become very successful over time. Now, what turtles are, evolutionarily speaking, is they fall under this very unique classification of being an anapsid. And if you recall from our previous discussion about the sort of split between the, the lineage that became the synapsids and the lineage that became the um, seropsids, we talked about these anapsids being part of that seropsid line. Whereas all the other seropsids uh, had two holes in their head, anapsids only had one of these temporal fenestrations in their head. So in this picture, the figure below picture below would be considered uh, more closely related to the turtles, whereas the one on top could be uh, more closely related to lizards or snakes or even alligators or birds. So this has kind of led people to just automatically assume that since this is of the all the extant vertebrates, the vertebrates that are alive today, uh, of the amniotes that are alive today, they might be the most primitive of these. But the reality is that they're a very derived group. And it is very likely that they lost those two holes that they once had. And there must have been a reason for this. So in no way do turtles represent um, the basal amniote condition, if you will. So holes in the head. Why do you think we would rely on a, on a, on a trait like this, a character like this, to define what a turtle is when turtles in general are very very obvious when you look at them so take a take a moment to think about that why do we use characteristics like skulls when we have things like shells to work with to identify turtles in the fossil record Well, it's a tough question. I'll give you that. It is a tough question. The, re the reality is that usually you're dealing with bones, uh, but shells do get fossilized. So there are fossilized shells. Uh, I have a few myself. But remember, you're trying to look for, say, the ancestor of a turtle. We don't know exactly when the shell evolved itself. So the goal is to find the earliest ancestor of this lineage, which may or may not have a shell. So finding some other characteristic that can be present in the fossil record is a good way to go about this. So that's why we rely on some of these very obscure traits that may not be under intense selection, so aren't expected to change very often. So let's talk about the the Chelonia or the Testudines, the turtles. As you can imagine, turtles are very, 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 very highly conserved. And all that means is that they, they have synapomorphies that represent the group, and there isn't a lot of variation on this on this, this uh, trend, which is why turtles are very easily recognizable. Obviously, they have the shell. They don't have any teeth. They've lost the teeth in their maxilla. They have a horny beak instead, right? And a sharpened, a sharpened edge uh, that allows them to cut through things. Um, they're slow. You've seen pickle. They're slow. They're uh, they're all egg layers, so they're all oviparous. They don't exhibit any sort of complex parental care for their hatchlings. Basically, parental care in the case of a turtle is essentially finding a good nest site. Once you find a good nest site, the offspring are pretty much on their own. And the other sort of very interesting characteristic of turtles is how long they live. Even the smallest turtle could live quite a long time relative to its body size. So here are some examples of, of uh, really old tortoises. So Lonesome George was a tortoise <coughs> that lived at the Charles Darwin Research Station in the Galapagos Islands. And... They call him Lonesome George because he was the last of his type of tortoise uh, on that particular island, but he's got this high ridge on his shell. Uh, and he was born, it was estimated in 1910, and his life is one of the most documented lives of any animal, and he died in 2012. 
If you think that's impressive, uh, in the Seychelles Islands, which is an island chain off of the coast, off of the eastern coast of Africa, uh, it's its own country, uh, there is a tortoise, Jonathan, that um, was born in 1832 and is still alive. And Jonathan of Seychelles actually is, uh, is currently living in England. Like most, uh, most ancient things, it ends up in England somehow, and it's always a controversy about getting it back. So if you have these sort of really, really um, evolutionarily conserved characteristics, what are some of the characteristics that can be different uh, among turtles? Well, there's a few different things that can uh, influence turtle morphology and turtle behavior uh, that is shaped by whatever the evolutionary conditions that are allowing the turtle to advance, if you will, in its own habitat. So when we look at turtles and turtle assemblage, you're seeing a very strong effect of whatever the lifestyle of the turtle is on the way it looks and the way it behaves. So habitat type. Turtles like rivers, turtles like ponds, turtles like the edges of ponds, turtles like the deep end of ponds, uh, turtles like the land. So all of these will have different evolutionary pressures that will shape the morphology of the shell, that will shape the morphology of the limbs. Uh, they're going to be further altered by diet, by where they lay their eggs, how much of a nest they build, uh, what the egg morphology is going to look like. Are they small? Are they large? Are the offspring going to come out ready to, to, to go, like in a sea turtle, or are they going to require a little period of time where they stay near the nest, developmental aspects? So all of these things are going to shape turtle behavior and morphology. And because of the fact that turtles don't move around so much within a place because they're relatively slow, you end up with a situation where you can have one area with many species of turtles living in that same area all each occupying their own specific niches within that environment. So this is the case in Mead Gardens, for example, where we have 11 species of turtles that I've recorded there myself. So that's quite a substantial number of, of turtles for one small park in the middle of Winter Park. So there's a lot that can shape uh, turtle morphology, turtle behavior, turtle lifestyle. So let's talk about the shells. The turtle shell is actually a pretty complex structure. It's not its house, right? Like my kids say, all oh, the turtle carries its house on its back. It's not its house, it's its body, right? You know this, right? You can't take a turtle out of its shell, despite what the cartoons might tell you. Uh, the turtle shell is basically divided into two parts, the upper carapace and the lower plastron, right? And then the body of the turtle is in between. The carapace itself is made up of bone, specifically eight of these plates, these dermal plates, that come off of the vertebrae. And between the vertebrae and the bones on the vertebrae and the bones of the ribs, or what we call the costal bones, right? These elongate, they become kind of flattened, right? And then they fuse. And when they all fuse together, the vertebrae and the ribs and everything together, it forms this under layer of dermal bone. So that's bone. That's the dermal bone. It's not to be confused with what you see on the turtle whenever you pick it up. What you'll see are little plates, right? If you look on the back of a turtle, little plates. These are scutes. What these are are basically the skin of the turtle. They're made of keratin, beta keratin. And because they're made of, uh, you know, they're made of the same stuff as fingernails, right, or hair. And if you ever come out, you know, turtle trapping with me and when I mark the turtles, I mark them on these marginal scutes on the edges, and I mark them in a certain way, and I use a little Dremel tool. If you sniff closely to that Dremel tool, you'll smell burnt hair. That's basically what you're smelling, the same sort of thing. Scutes are lined up over the bones. Now, where they meet, the bones as well as the scutes, you have these suture lines. But if you look at a turtle, they're not going to line up perfectly. So here on this diagram here, you see a turtle, uh, turtle drawing. 
you have the black lines, the black scutes, these indicate the scutes, the keratin. But underlying them, you have the white, oh no, sorry, the, um, the black on the diagram are showing the bones. So there's a lot more vertebrae bones there. You see a lot more of the ribs and the marginal scutes. And then if you look closely, you'll see the white lines, the white patterning. Those are the scutes. Those are the coverings you see over the bones. Same thing happens with the plastron. Right? So the plastron is the same sort of thing. You have um, the bones, and then you have this overlayer of scutes. And the way these things are named in a very specific sort of way, uh, scutes are basically uh, named, you know, there's basically a few types of scutes. They're named based on their relative positions. So we'll talk about the, you know, the cervical, the vertebral, and then the plural scutes around them. And then the ones on the edges are the marginal scutes, and those are the ones that I mark. When you look at the actual plastron, so that's on the carapace, if you look at the actual plastron, they're named based on the, the anatomical position. So guler means neck. Uh, humeral, the humerus bone, pectoral, the chest, abdomen, abdominal, femoral, anal, right? Those are basically the, the body types. So those are the scutes in the top of that picture. Below it are the bones, and the bones are a little more complicated because they're bones, right? But again, these aren't lining up. They're not perfect copies of each other. So the carapace and the plastron in the bones looks different from the, the carapace and the plastrons for the scutes. If you look on the side view, uh, you'll also see some some differences. So here's a turtle shell, uh, and or a tortoise shell specifically, a male and a female. Some characteristics and how to tell males apart from females. Males tend to have a longer tail. Uh, their cloaca, which is the opening uh, in their tail, uh, extends past the shell. But in many species, you can also notice that the plastron is a little bit concave because as you probably know the male has to mount the female and when that happens that concave uh, shape helps it to accommodate right whereas in the females it's a lot flatter males also have secondary sexual characteristics that are associated with uh, territoriality and fighting over females or fighting over territory right so um, in the case of tortoises some species have a very long what they call guler shield this is a long projection uh, of the guler scutes and the guler bone or the cervical bone and the, the cervical scutes and what it does is it basically acts as a uh, lever for getting under and flipping and pushing uh, other individuals out right in the case of pond turtles such as the sliders that i study in lake virginia uh, males have longer nails and they actually use the nails on their on their feet for for combat which is the most hilarious thing uh, you'll ever see if you ever get a chance to see it I'm still trying to make a good video of that. So, where do turtles come from? The origin of the turtles seems to date back to the Permian. There are many potential first turtles, or first in the lineage that became turtles. Um, by, by the Permian, you see a lot of species that are adapted, of course, to the dry interior of the Permian period. You had Pangaea at this time. So Pangaea is hot and dry in the interior. It's pretty wet and moist in the coast. So you saw the beginning of scales, right? So you start seeing the in the fossil record these slightly more squat, larger animals that have very intensive scale patterns. So for a long time, it was thought that the you know, the, the ancestor would be found there. And there have been a few species that have been proposed. So one is um, Unotosaurus. Unotosaurus is basically looks like a very, very, uh, very, very fat lizard, like a lizard that just ate something that's really huge. Uh, its midsection is very, very large. The, rib, the ribs are pretty wide. You see the beginning of a potential shell, but there's no shell. So without a shell, it's kind of hard to tell. When you look at the skull of Unitosaurus, uh, you don't quite see the, the you sort of see the anapsid condition, but not quite. Uh, previously, when I was learning this stuff, Scutosaurus, everybody made a big deal about this Scutosaurus, which was a large, large creature. Uh, it was sort of a dominant sort of herbivore of its time. And it was a species that had um, a brigadine armor. So it had these plates that were overlapping in nature. 
A lot of debate about how they relate to present-day turtles, uh, whether they became that lineage. You can see it's moving around too fast to be a turtle. It doesn't quite look like a turtle. It actually looks pretty intimidating. And in case you're curious about Brigadine armor, uh, you've probably seen Brigadine armor before. Brigadine armor is what uh, they used in medieval times, basically overlapping hard plates. And they basically uh, protected the warrior from being cut by a sword or an arrow or something like that. Right? So it's a very hard, you know, it's a very old sort of uh, strategy for minimizing damage in a fight. So even though we have these potentials, we still don't quite have the ancestor of the turtles. Right? And we think it started in the Permian. But we don't quite have that um, that individual. And by the end of the Permian and the beginning of the Triassic period, which uh, followed the Permian after the great dying of the Permian extinction, you had uh, all of the lineages of turtles that we know now in our life today were present. So which species became all those, we don't know. And they almost certainly survived the great dying because they would have had to. But we don't, we don't quite have that ancestor. So this is a picture showing kind of what is a hypothetical um, turtle ancestor might have looked like, right? Uh, Aleo Achilles is a pretty old turtle, right? But it's, uh, it's still very much got all of the derived apomorphies of the turtles. So, you know, whether it's the, the first one, it's probably not the case. So there's other options, right? The fossil record is one thing, but what about modern techniques? Well, again, the story is not 100% clear. When you look at molecular evidence and you compare it with the bone evidence, you know, osteology evidence, and then you look at, you know, uh, various characteristics pertaining to the soft tissue of animals and, and the and physiology and, and, and anatomy and things like that, you still can't place turtles, right? In some cases, uh, you have turtles lining up with the archosaurs that became the, uh, you know, the, the dinosaurs and, and the birds. Then you have the uh, turtles being just another reptile. And then you have turtles being somewhat closer to, to mammals, right? And representing some sort of pre-mammal condition. We don't know. Maybe turtles are mammals. Maybe the Ninja Turtles was a thing. Who knows? Okay, so let's talk about turtles. Uh, when you can break turtles down into two groups, the cryptodira and the pleurodira, the difference between these two is what do they do when they're scared? What do they do with their neck? When you scare a pleurodira turtle, it stands for side neck, and basically what they do is they'll curve their neck into their shell and protect it that way, leaving the neck somewhat exposed, but they don't retract it in fully. Uh, Pleurodia tend to have a pretty long neck, and that's because a lot of them are um, are feeding on fish, so they're more of an active predator. So when they retract their head, they do it into their shell, they do it in a sideways way. As you can imagine, these are mostly aquatic turtles, and they're only found in the southern hemisphere. The cryptodire, on the other hand, is probably what you're more familiar with, the hidden necks. And basically, you touch these turtles, you bother these turtles, what are they going to do? They're going to bend their neck completely into their shell. In some cases, they can put their legs in front to block their head. It's a much better sort of protection system. And they do so by essentially retracting their neck in this esh-like pattern into their, into their shell. And they've gone on to occupy all sorts of habitats, and they're primarily from the northern hemisphere. So it's interesting you have these two turtle suborders, one primarily in the southern hemisphere, two originated in the northern hemisphere, although now they've infiltrated well into the southern hemisphere. Why do you think you have this separation in these two lineages from uh, by hemisphere? Well, continental drift. So during the Permian in Pangaea, at some point, the turtle ancestor evolved. 
And the turtle ancestor was able to colonize a good chunk of Pangaea, which, as you remember, was all the continents, right? So all the present-day continents were joined in some way, shape, or form during the Permian period. But then, as you shifted from the Permian into the Triassic, you got this split into two larger, into two large land masses. Uh, Gondwana land, Gondwana, which is essentially the southern hemisphere, so South America, Africa, Australia, India, as well as uh, Antarctica, and then Laurasia, which is basically North America and the Eurasian continent. So this split happened sort of in the mid to late Triassic, right? So 200 some odd, 170, 175 to 215 million years ago. So with this split came a vast ocean, the Tethys Ocean, and even today, you see lineages that go back to this split, right? Uh, Gondwana is essentially what we consider the tropical places. It stayed in the tropics for a while. The environment was tropical, so it stayed near the equator. Whereas Laurasia moved further north. And now today, when you look at um, species around the world, biogeographically, you can separate them into tropical species and temperate species. A lot of that boiled down to this split that happened. So... The same thing with the turtles, right? The ones that stayed in Gondwana became the Pleurodira, the Sidenecks. The ones that stayed in the um, Northern Hemisphere became the Cryptodira. Now, when some of these continents reattached, like North America and South America with the Panamanian land bridge, or when Africa and India rejoined the Eurasian continent, you started to see that intrusion of Cryptodira into, um, into sort of those other continents. So that's... That explains where these two great turtle lineages arose. And so I always like it when you can find a nice, simple explanation to, to highlight the differences between particular groups of animals, like the hidden neck versus side neck turtles. Speaking of which, the reason that turtles can do this with their neck and bring their neck into their shell if they need to has to do with this. What do you notice in these two pictures? Well, hopefully you've keyed in on the main thing, which is the relative position of the scapula versus the ribs. In a human being, the rib cage, uh, in which envelopes the lungs and the heart, uh, the scapula, and hence the leg bone, or the leg or arm bone, whatever, the human, uh, the humerus in this case, the humerus is going to attach to the scapula outside of the rib cage. So as a result, if you were to try and pull your head in, you wouldn't have anywhere to pull it into. In contrast, turtles have this other condition where the scapula is located inside of the ribs. And because of this difference, uh, you can essentially accommodate bringing in your, your legs, bringing in the, the turtle legs, turtle arms, as well as the neck. You can accommodate that because your scapula is what's ultimately going to you know, going to help sort of control your, your head movements. So you can bring it in, contract, and bring the whole thing into your rib cage, right? So turtles can do this because of this one skeletal characteristic. So the thing about turtles is they all look the same. They all kind of have that same design with the shell. And it is a very successful design. And what I mean by that is turtles evolved long time ago and have become a very successful group able to occupy every in continent uh, in, in the world um, and even Antarctica at some point, very presumably. It's hard to tell because we don't have fossils from there. But presumably they were in Antarctica too. So they've been able to do this with this winning design of having a shell on your back uh, for protection and defense. But at the same time, Turtles not only have they benefited from their shell, but they also 
having to deal with the consequences of having a shell. And this consequence, the main one, is metabolism. I'm sure you've realized turtles have a very low metabolism. So there's an essentially a trade-off between having a shell and uh, altering your metabolism. So before I go any further, what is a trade-off? How would you define a trade-off? Well, you only ever have to do a trade-off when you're trying to run two things at the same time. Every process, physiological process, evolutionary process, morphological structure, they have an optimum, meaning that an optimal design or an optimal capacity. Now, in a world where energy is unlimited and opportunities are unlimited, uh, everything can operate at maximum performance. But when you have a situation where things are not limited, or things are limited, where let's say you don't have enough energy, uh, and you have to make a decision between running one process versus another, or growing one trait versus another, well, then you have to make this decision, and especially if they're very vital processes or vital things that have to be, then instead of running them at their optimum, you choose to run them uh, at a suboptimal level. And that's basically what a trade-off is, right? If you only have enough energy to invest in so much physiology, well, you might have to, you know, not run your circulatory system as effectively as you could or not run your, your respiratory system as effectively as you could so that you could run some other processes that also have to happen. So that's a trade-off, basically. It's very straightforward kind of thing. Now, in the case of turtles, metabolism was the big cost that they paid. Right? They have a very slow metabolism, and as a result, they're slow. They're slow in every aspect uh, of, of the word, from how long it takes for their cells to, to replenish, all the way to their running speed, their breathing rates, everything, how fast they use energy, how often they eat, all that is slow. So let's talk about respiration. So the lungs of a turtle are inside of the shell, obviously. And they're attached to the underside of the carapace. They're also attached to, um, to uh, muscles uh, and via connective tissue. And in particular, they have one large muscle, uh, an abdominal muscle that runs through a good section of their body. So here you have a picture, sort of a cross section of a turtle and it shows its lungs. So look at this picture. It's showing what the normal breathing would look like and it's showing what happens when the animal pushes its uh, arms and, and head inside, let's say it got frightened of something. What's going on with its lung? And how do you think breathing happens in this animal? Well, fun fact, when human beings or any other kind of mammal or something breathes, think about when you take a breath. You're taking in a breath, what happens to your chest cavity? Well, your diaphragm relaxes, you breathe in, your chest cavity expands, your rib expands, your diaphragm relaxes, and all of this creates space, right? And you puff out your chest, and then you bring it in as you exhale, 
and you breathe in and you breathe and you breathe out right and you're expanding your chest cavity the whole time a turtle cannot expand its chest cavity its ribs are fused together and they form a shell so it doesn't have that luxury of expanding lungs as much as it can to draw in air so the way that it's able to expand its lungs is by the expanding the space that's provided there. So how does it do this? Well, it does it by keeping its arms uh, out of its shell. So whenever turtles walk, the act of moving their arms actually provides space and powers the muscles that help with uh, ventilation. So that's that's the big thing. Now. It's great because the faster they move, the faster they breathe. When they have to retract, they'll shut down their breathing. But it does provide pressure, right? Because when they retract, their, their, their lungs taking up less space, but it's providing pressure on the inside. So this is really limited uh, because respiration is key to having a good metabolism, right? That's how you get your oxygen to power your, your aerobic glycolysis that you need for energy. This has put a real limit on what they can do. But it also allows them to slow down their metabolism. It allows them to stay underwater for a very long time uh, by just minimizing their activity. As they expand activity, more breathing is required. In the, there's an interesting example in Australia on the Fitzroy River. There's the Fitzroy River turtle, which is a highly critically endangered species. Very few of them are there. And it's one species that has an absolutely unique thing. It's an aquatic species, it lives in the water, uh, but it, when it wants to breathe, what it'll do is instead of sticking its head out in the air, it'll stick its cloaca up in the air, up into the air, and breathe that way. So it's actually able to power up its lungs through cloacal breathing, right? And it can actually secrete CO2 that way, which is pretty crazy. So very again, very unique adaptation, uh, and it's an adaptation to these rivers that can often dry up very quickly, and CO2 can build up in them with low oxygen levels. So that's respiration. That puts a limit on what they can do. Here's another limit. Circulation. If you put circulation or heart and turtle, you're going to get this picture of this little hatchling um, red-eared slider that was born with a hole in its heart and its heart was visible. So its heart is visible through its plastron. So it's quite a cute story. Uh, it was adopted by uh, by somebody, it was kind of like a runt of the litter kind of story, so very cute. But once you filter through that, you start getting more scientific stuff about circulation in turtles. Turtles have essentially what we can call a, a three-chambered heart in that they have a, a left atrium, they have a right atrium, and they have a ventricle. And the ventricle is on its way to becoming separated by the um, ventricular septum, but it's not a complete separation. So they, the septum is just a term for something in the middle of a chamber. So it's an incomplete ventricular septum, or IVC, as it's shown here. And the result is you have almost two more ventricles, you know, you have almost two ventricles, but not quite. But you do have two atria. One is taking care of the pulmonary side of things. It's helping, um, you know, get collect all the blood coming back from your arteries, or from your sorry. It has all the it's blood coming back from the the veins that are coming back from from the lungs and getting oxygenated. And then you have this left atrium, um, oh sorry, right atrium, which is collecting the deoxygenated blood from the rest of your body. So. Long story short, you have this separation of oxygenated blood, nice crisp stuff that you want to, to bathe your organs in, and then you have this spent up, used, full of carbon dioxide, deoxygenated blood that you kind of want to, to reoxygenate. Now, they're coming into their respective atria together, right, or the, the um, LA and RA as it's shown up here on this on this figures. But then there's this period, this place in the ventricle being shared where they can mix. So what does this cause for metabolism? Your mixing gene are oxygenated with your deoxygenated blood.
Well, right away, you're cutting down your oxygen availability, right? Because you just got this oxygenated blood from your lungs, and the first thing you're going to do is going to mix it with the crappy blood. So this is another thing that limits turtles uh, in terms of their metabolism. Now, there are some species that have come up with very unique adaptations that are very specific um, with, that involves them being able to shut down their pulmonary circuit when they need to. And the best example of this are sea turtles that uh, undergo diving behavior. So, for example, leatherback turtles are some of the deepest diving animals there are, uh, and they can dive, you know, 4,200 feet, it says here. That's insane, right? The pressures of that that um, depth are incredible. And you have this animal that's, uh, you know, it's the largest turtle in terms of size. It's the largest sea turtle, largest turtle in general, and it dives way back down. And in doing so, it's holding its breath, right? It's not breathing. So one way to power that dive is to shut all of the um, extraneous flow that would normally be going to the lungs because you're not using your lungs. And instead, send that to your uh, the rest of your body so you can use a little more oxygen. So you're pushing that oxygen limit a little bit. So that's a unique adaptation that allows them to do these dives. It's not sustainable in the long term, but it's certainly helpful for this specific purpose. So again, circulation and respiration both, not a favor for turtles in terms of their metabolism, but they do get by and get by successfully. Now here is a picture, a graph showing differences in temperature in three different species of reptiles, two turtles, uh, red-eared slider, and uh, macroclemmies is the uh, alligator snapping turtle, and an actual alligator. And it's showing um, the sex ratio as percent male across this range of temperatures. So what is being shown here? Well, essentially what it's showing is that depending on the species, uh, particular temperatures are going to be associated with a higher degree of males in, um, in the nest, right? So in the case of uh, an alligator snapping turtle, Macroclemys tecuminii, uh, you have a range between sort of, you know, um, I don't know, what is it, 25 to 27 degrees. Within that range in Celsius, uh, you're going to get the most production of males. But if you fall too cold or too warm re relative to that, uh, you're going to shift your offspring towards females. In the case of the red-eared slider, this, might have, this is an interesting uh, difference, Trachemys scripta, at low temperatures, so anything below 28, you're going to get almost entirely males. As it gets warmer, you're looking at uh, more and more females. So less and less males, more and more females. And you see the similar sort of thing with alligators, right? So all three of these species have an example of what they call temperature-dependent sex determination, or TDSD. And unlike mammals, which have genetic-based sex determination, right? We have a X, you know, two X chromosomes as a female, and XY as a male. We have chromosomes determining what sex we are. In the case of, of turtles, it's driven by temperature, right? And there's an evolutionary benefit here, right? Uh, and a lot of species engage in this. So what might be an evolutionary benefit? And what might be a downside? Well, in terms of an evolutionary benefit, it gives you a certain degree of control over the sex. It's indirect, but a certain degree of control over what sex your offspring are going to be. So depending on the makeup of your population, it might be more favorable to produce more males or more females in order to increase the opportunities for mating for your offspring in order to pass down your genetics. So if you're in a population of all males, for example, or, you know, a heavily male skewed population, it wouldn't be all males, but heavily skewed male population, well, you might 
Select for nest sites that might be warmer so that you can favor the production of females so that each female would have more opportunities to mate and hence higher opportunity to get better genes, etc. Flip side, right? If it's a mostly female population, having, uh, you know, having more males would likewise increase the chances of your male offspring. So there is a downside here. There's a benefit in that you have a certain level of control. The downside is if your environment changes, you might also lose that control. So in case you want to remember how to, to remember this, I always learned it as cool dudes, hot chicks. Basically, cooler temperatures tend to favor males. Warmer temperatures tend to favor females. Uh, it really varies depending on the species and depending on the type of animals you're looking for, but it does generally apply to turtles. So a downside. Well, how might these two be related? This is the coast of Florida somewhere probably Miami, and a cute little baby sea turtle. Well, there's the obvious, which is that Nestling sea turtles are born on beaches and having human activity around is never good if you're trying to be born on a beach and make your way to the ocean. So of course there's going to be human disturbance, there's going to be habitat loss, but even more importantly, you know, a beach is a fairly uniform habitat. So depending on where on the beach you're laid, you're going to get a pretty similar result. But when you build tall buildings, you cast a shadow. And what they've shown time and time again, uh, it started in Florida, but they've pretty much shown this around the world, is that large coastal developments, hotels, apartments, condos, stuff like that, um, cast shadows on, on beaches and essentially alter the course of um, temperatures. So the temperature distribution across a beach can vary now. When sea turtles come up to nest, they're usually doing this at night. So they have no understanding of what the daytime is going to look like in terms of shadows. And of course, they're going to change through time. This is especially a big consideration because um, south-facing, you know, um, you know uh, later in the day is when you're going to get the more um, intense light coming from the west. So ideally, you want to capitalize on that light. But on the East Coast, the buildings block that light. So you get your heaviest shadows during that time, which means you end up with a very different gradient of temperatures. And the result is, when you multiply this around the world, is you're seeing this shift towards nests being colder and a greater percentage of offspring produced are going to be male. And you're starting to see these developmental shifts in sex play out in adult populations. So now around the world, you're seeing this general skew towards male sea turtles. And demographically, that's going to cause huge problems in, later on. Uh, and it's already starting to now. Again, because sea turtles, like all turtles, live quite a long time, it takes a while for these sort of effects to manifest. So studies done in the 80s and early 90s are only now starting to see these bigger population level changes. So again, sea turtle conservation. So now it's time for our Florida turtle quiz. And with our first one, it's on the beach somewhere, name that turtle. Well, it's a sea turtle. It's a Ridley sea turtle. It's a Kemp's Ridley sea turtle. It's the turtle that we don't tend to see that often. Uh, like all turtles, they are endangered. They're primarily a Caribbean species of turtle, uh, but they've suffered some of the biggest drops in turtle numbers, especially here. Um, but there's like mall sea turtles, you're starting to see these increases in part because of very intensive efforts to preserve them at the nest and uh, to head start them into the ocean, the offspring. So 
Kemp's sea turtle. It's a cool one. Be on the lookout. Now here's another sea turtle. Ah, look at the young, the young Dr. F. Beaded necklace, baggy pants. That's what I'm talking about. So this was taken in South Carolina when I worked at the Savannah River site. And I'm holding a fairly large alligator snapping turtle. So alligator snapping turtles uh, are found in Florida. They're found in northern Florida, unlike common snapping turtles, which kind of live throughout the state. They're more restricted to the north, and they prefer larger rivers. So that's the habitat for them, is to find them in some of the larger river systems. And specifically, when you compare the river systems in Florida, the big river systems in northern Florida, like the Apalachicola and the Alachafaya, uh, you actually, they're cut off from each other. So when you do the genetic studies, you actually find pretty distinct genetic differences. And recently, alligator snapping turtles have been uh, broken down into multiple species, each based on a river system. So there's two in Florida that are based, uh, that are alligator snapping turtles. So now we can say that there's three snapping turtles in Florida. The common snapping turtle and these two alligator snapping turtles. Look at that dark hair. Oh, what happened? Speaking of Florida and turtles, here's another one. Very distinctive one, the cool looking one. Well, this turtle is part of a bigger group of turtles known as map turtles. And map turtles are in the genus Graptomys, and they, they're, they're known for having this very distinctive um, yellow-black pattern on their face. It's very bright and colorful. But the real distinctive thing for these guys is their, their shell, their carapace. It's, very, it's got this sort of serrated saw back. It's very high, very sort of triangular, and it's got this sort of spikes on its back. So those are distinctive uh, characteristics of map turtles. And this one in particular is the barber's map turtle, which is only found in North Florida and is hence an endangered species. So kind of a difficult turtle to find, but it's nonetheless a cool addition to Florida to our Florida habitats here. Here's another turtle. Oh my goodness, look at that hair. That's, that's a little earlier 90s than the one I showed you before, back when you can get away with wearing khakis in the field. Well, that's actually a nesting spiny softshell turtle. So softshell turtles don't have keratinized scutes. Instead, they have cartilage and they have sort of a, a, a thick epidermal layer. So it's very different. Um, they also don't have necessarily the bones. It's more cartilage. So it makes for a softer shell, hence the name. Uh, in Florida, you have the spiny softshell turtle on the east coast and in the north. And then you have the Gulf Coast uh, softshell turtle, which is on the Gulf Coast. So go figure. And they're kind of separate in the middle. Um, you also have a distinctive Florida softshell turtle, which is more the inland turtle. And that's the one that you often see around here. So very cool species, very, very cool. Here's another cool species. Well, this is a sort of typical turtle that you would find in a pond that tends to bask out on a log or something. This is an example of one of the many species of pond turtles, which belong to the family Amidae. This is actually a, a yellow-bellied slider, which is the, the turtle that's supposed to be the most common turtle in Florida. It's recently been ousted by another species that's an, that's, uh, an introduced species from the pet trade. But pond turtles have this sort of characteristic look to them, uh, very distinct yellow uh, and black markings on their plastron, their carapace is marked like this, but they're the species of turtle that's primarily the aquatic one. 
Often you don't see these characteristics because you'll have algae covering their carapace. Uh, but nonetheless, it's one of many species of pond turtles here. And actually, here's another species of pond turtle. So you see, the uh, turtle biology is very much a family affair. So you probably can't tell the turtle that well, but my daughter Petra here, uh, my young my young daughter Petra here, she doesn't look like that anymore, but she's carrying a uh, red-eared slider. So this is the introduced species that's made its way into Florida, uh, and it's a species that is ubiquitous around the world. I have personally seen it on every continent I've been on, and in all cases, it's very common, especially in urban areas. Now, beyond simply outcompeting other species and also potentially hybridizing with a lot of other species, which causes problems that way, red-eared sliders also have this very dubious thing of being so common that people see them all the time. And it's hard to convince people that turtles are not doing well when you could just go to your neighborhood pond and see a ton of turtles. Most people will not try to learn the different species so they'll just assume that turtles are doing okay even if it is only in their area so they'll completely take over a pond they're the most common turtle by far in lake virginia and they're not supposed to be here they're a native of the mississippi drainage but because of the fact that there's the, they're really wanted in the pet trade in both the united states as well as in china they are bred by the millions to uh, fuel this pet trade. So even though they're captive bred, they tend to get released because they do get pretty big. And they don't necessarily make the best pets. Here's another turtle and another child. So this is a bit of a cheater. But uh, this is Silas, my, my son, back when he was a baby and he used to have the pacifier in his mouth all the time. And he's playing with a very large African spurthite tortoise. And African spurthite tortoise, as the name suggests, they're not supposed to be here. There are the occasional feral animals, but they're a very common pet animal. Uh, but they do often escape. They're very much a burrower like most tortoises, so you got to be very wary of, of where you have these these guys because if they can escape, they can establish. And there are records here and there of wild populations of these, but they've never been really verified. But nonetheless, a very cool, definitely one of the larger turtle species. And Silas liked them. So name this turtle. So I showed you young pictures of my kids when they're really, really little. And here is, uh, well, it's hard to tell who's older, the turtle or the teacher. This is Dr. S, Dr. Stevenson. And Dr. Stevenson loves coming out with me and catching turtles. And every time we do so, we seem to catch a snapping turtle, a common snapping turtle. And then he picks it up and then he makes it the profile of his Facebook page which I think is hilarious. He literally replaced one turtle picture with another turtle picture of him holding one of these turtles. So this is a common snapping turtle. This is the turtle that we catch in the gardens, which is where this picture is taken. And um, unlike the alligator snapping turtle, it's more ubiquitous. It's found throughout the eastern U.S. Uh, there's even Central American and South American versions of, of this species. And they're very, very successful. And that's because they're ambush predators and they've occupy a very specific niche. And they're usually the biggest turtle in the place they live, which definitely helps. So we're going to move on from turtles. And as we move on from turtles, I want you to think about something in your past that has really bothered you. You know, in many ways, we like to think that we escape our past, but our past helped to shake who we are and only when you're able to completely shed away whatever whatever's left over from parts of your past can you begin to really look forward and move on and become a better you so don't be stuck in the past ladies and gentlemen and i will talk to you when i talk to you bye bye